Malisandra Checo, President of the New York Alternative Investment Roundtable. We're glad you were able to join us this afternoon. First off, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Roundtable sponsors, which are currently shown on the screen. We are so thankful to have such a wonderful group of actively involved sponsors from within the industry. Now for a few logistical issues. If you have not that yet done so, please be sure to mute your phones and your computers. If you have not participated in a virtual event before, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat feature that you'll find in the lower right-hand corners of your screen. You can use this function to ask questions of the panelists, which we encourage you to do so. Now, this afternoon's topic, Alternative Investment Data Fest. Today's panelists are Jean Gutman, a Client Portfolio Manager at Lombard ODA Investment Managers, 1798 Alternatives Group. Peter Fayez, Chief Data Scientist at RavenPack, and Catherine Wilkins, the founder of PearlQuest and an advisor for the Financial Data Professional Institute. Our moderate reader this afternoon is Rick Roach, a Managing Director with Little Harbor Advisors. And now I'd like to turn things over to Rick. Thank you, Allie, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rick Roach. I'm a 39-year investment management veteran, a chartered alternative investment analyst, and a member of the New York Alternative Investment Roundtable, but enough about me already. Today's New York Alternative Investment Roundtable discussion is titled The Alternative Investment Data Fest. For millennial, data was rare. It was cherished and closely guarded, but in the mid-20th century, a geological blink of the eye, we vaulted from a state of data scarcity to one of data glut. We've gone from a drought to drowning in data, flooded in facts, saturated in stats. IBM, an international data corporation, IDC, estimate that 90% of the world's data has been created in the past two years. Digital data is doubling at an exponential rate. Nate Silver, a renowned statistician and editor-in-chief at 538, says, every day, three times per second, we produce the equivalent amount of data that the Library of Congress has in its entire collection. Today, digital data is undergoing its own Cambrian era. For those unfamiliar with geological periods, the Cambrian period took place roughly 543 million years ago when rapid diversification of multicellular animal life resulted in the massive explosion of new life forms. So where's all this data coming from? Alternative data sets include data acquired via scraping tools that harvest web traffic and extract product reviews, social media chatter, Google search trends, or consumer investor sentiment. Alternative data generated by businesses includes company exhaust data, credit card purchases, and email purchase receipts. And data is generated by sensors, such as satellite images, foot traffic via smartphone GPS, and the Internet of Things, IoT. The definition of alternative data changes with time. As the data source becomes widely available, it's then mainstream and no longer considered alternative. Today, We'll discuss the enormous growth in the availability and use of alternative investment data among both discretionary portfolio managers, chartered analysts, and quantitative investment strategists. In a moment, all three panelists will take three to four minutes to introduce themselves and introduce the organizations they represent. Then I'll ask them a series of prepared questions. Finally, we'll open up the floor to questions. As Ali indicated, there's a chat box there. Please feel free to send your questions throughout the program. We have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern, so you can get on with your day. So let's begin. Kathy, we're going to have you introduce yourself and your organization first, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's event. Uh, using alternative data and machine learning applications for finance is something that I'm really um, passionate about. Uh, as you can see in this slide, I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to go into detail about all of these different um, websites, but I just thought it might be nice for those of you that are not familiar with these sites um, to have them available to you. 
uh, in what we see here is that there's just been an explosion in the growth of web APIs or application um, programming interface. Uh, these are ways to share data and there's a lot of free APIs out there and those are the ones that I focused on here. And there's so many um, that there's these directories towards the bottom on the right are very helpful. You can see that the, some of these directories list thousands and thousands of APIs that are free to use and um, explore on your own. But uh, about um, my role uh, with the Financial Data Professional Institute, uh, I'm the founder of Worldwest LLC, which is a consulting company specializing in alternative investment products and education, including the implementation of data science techniques in finance. I have a PhD in finance from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I am a Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst member. I was the Curriculum Director at Kaya in its formative years, and I'm now the Curriculum and Exam Advisor to Kaya's new Financial Data Professional Program. The FDP curriculum provides industry practitioners with a working knowledge of the increasingly important roles played by big and alternative data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in the financial services industry. I'm also a research associate for the Center for International Securities and Derivatives Markets, which is home to the Morningstar CISDM hedge fund indices. And I've been an assistant editor for the Journal of Alternative Investments for the past 10 years. I regularly contribute reports to the Practical Applications Journal for Pageant Media, the publisher of a Journal of Alternative Investments, uh, which is actually the official journal to the Kaya Association. And Pageant Media also publishes a new journal, the Journal of Financial Data Science, which uh, several articles are included in the FDP curriculum. I'm also an adjunct professor for the University of Massachusetts, and I'll be teaching financial modeling in the fall. Um, I'll tell you more about the FDP Institute, the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association established the FDP Institute to create the FDP Charter. The FDP designation is the first of its kind in the industry and reflects expertise in data science and its practical applications in finance. Charter holders must pass an exam consisting of nine topics on machine learning, including a topic on the uh, relevant ethical issues involved. We place a heavyweight on the final topic of big data and machine learning in finance. Two short online courses on either the use of the R statistical program or Python programming are also required to earn the charter. The curriculum is developed with the input of our advisory board and curriculum committee, which are comprised of professors and industry leaders. Great job, Kathy. Thank you very much. Hey, Peter, you are the, the farthest traveler in this virtual meeting, joining us today from Spain. So, Peter, would you kindly introduce yourself and Raven Pack to the audience? Thank you, uh, Rich. Uh, sure. Uh, yes, my name is Peter Hafiz. I'm the uh, Chief Data Scientist at Raven Pack. I'm also very happy to be part of this uh, panel. Um, a little bit about us as a company. Uh, Raven Pack is a big data analytics company with expertise in natural language processing. So basically what we do is that we turn unstructured content, primarily news, blogs, social media, into a set of uh, analytics uh, that we sell into the financial industry, both on the discretionary side as well as on the uh, quant side. Uh, we basically allow our clients to ingest the systematically uh, news content into their algorithms. So we, um, we cover about 20,000 different types of news sources globally. Uh, we cover uh, companies, uh, people, uh, products, places, organizations, currencies, and commodities. Whenever they appear in the news, we track uh, up to 7,000 different types of what we call actionable events. That could be anything related to 
business news, uh, business events, sorry, economic events, uh, geopolitical and environmental events. So you will be able to track uh, companies going through M&A activity or having uh, lawsuits against them, uh, companies that beat expectations and earnings or are laying off people uh, on, on the company side. On the macro side, you'll have anything to do with uh, uh, elections, uh, you'll have uh, human and natural disasters, but also more traditional economic data like uh, GDP um, uh, numbers or GDP guidance even. So all of this information you can ingest into your, your uh, models uh, automatically. We also supply information around sentiment, so that's one of our uh, the areas where we are uh, widely known. Um, and as a business, we've been around for more than uh, 15 years. Uh, we were the first ones to launch a news analytics product back in 2007, so have been uh, in the marketplace with a product uh, uh, for, for quite some time uh, as well. Um, uh, on my own background, I come from uh, quant finance, uh, so I have a master's in quantitative finance from Cass Business School in London. Uh, I have worked with companies such as uh, Standard & Poor's and Credit Suisse, uh, and Saxo Bank before joining Ravenpack uh, 11 years ago. Peter, great job. Uh, and Jean, if you would kindly introduce yourself to an um, 1798 Fundamental Strategies Fund and Lombard ODA to the audience, that'd be great. Sure. Hi, everyone. Gene Getman here. I'm a senior product specialist and client relations manager here at Lombard ODA Investment Managers for our U.S. hedge fund strategies. Uh, this topic has been an interest of, for some time for, for, for myself. I'm fortunate enough to work with some really brilliant individuals on, on this that are experts in the space. Um, and we've authored a number of white papers uh, for investors over recent years. As a bit of background, Lombard ODA Investment Managers is the asset management business of the over 220-year-old Lombard ODA group. Um, the 1798 Alternatives brand launched in 2007 to really run our hedge funds and liquid alternatives offering. And today we run about $5 billion across nine strategies. And really our, our goal at 1798 is to provide investors with access to pedigree portfolio managers that are running differentiated or capacity constrained strategies, but without any of the typical business risk that's associated with smaller or more emerging managers. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work with Kesser Hassan, who is the portfolio manager for one of these strategies, which is our first market neutral strategy that's purpose built for extracting alpha from alternative data. And while things like big data have really become a buzzword over the last two years, he's really one of the pioneers in the creative application of alternative data, building out the first alternative data program at Point72 about eight years ago. Uh, over to you, Rick. Um, Kathy, to get the ball rolling, if you would kindly give a workable definition of alternative investment data for our audience today, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Uh, within the financial community, uh, alternative data Alternative data is um, pretty much understood to be that data that's not conventionally used in, invest in investment decision making. Um, some types include things like satellite imagery, social media streams, micro data about consumers' shopping activities, such as credit card transactions, data scraped from the internet. Um, and data exhaust, or sometimes that's called exhaust data, which is um, leftover kind of data, things like uh, cookies and other digital footprints created by people's um, browsing activities. That's terrific. Um, Peter, jumping in here, you know, trade-worthy worthy data really has an expiration date, you know, due to somewhat efficient markets and arbitrage. So benefits from traditional data sets, such as historical tick data and SEC filings, have high signal potential, but they're over-harvested. To date, what types of alternative investment data sets have gathered traction in the investment community, Peter? I would say, I mean, some of the things that uh, had, uh, have had quite a big, of, uh, big pickup uh, would uh, include something like credit card data. That was one of the data sets that a lot of the, the quant hedge funds started to consume relatively early. But also in the space that we are in, where you're looking at sentiment data or, or, or looking at news uh, using uh, extracting value using natural language processing has also been 
one of the data sets that have been around for, for uh, quite some time. As I mentioned, uh, we launched our product more than 10 years ago and, and have sort of seen a, a pick up in the marketplace since, since, since back then. Um, so I would say those are probably some of the, the most applied data sets. But of course, you are seeing, you saw a lot of interest around social media content like Twitter uh, a few years ago as well. Um, you have seen satellite imagery also uh, becoming uh, quite important uh, or quite getting uh, a lot of uh, interest. However, it's not as widely consumed um, and perhaps more on the discretionary side than on the quant side. Um, and um, and then of course, if you go into something like foot traffic, information coming from mobile phones and so on are also today uh, quite heavily utilized within uh, Quant Hedge Fund. Terrific, uh, Gene. Trying to get sort of a, a global view of the alternative investment data world or data sphere, if you will. Do you have a sense of how much in the aggregate is being spent on alternative investment data? And or again, you have a, 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 a strategy, the 1798 Fundamental Strategies Funds, that's actually incorporated and use alternative investment data. Do you have any ballpark figures for us, Gene, and what a fund might spend on alt data? Yeah, I mean, look, it really ranges across the board. I think today what you find is a lot of hedge funds are claiming to use alternative data. Because I think there's tremendous pressure from investors to show that they're using all the available resources. But, but I think uh, really the issue is the degree and the definitions of what one constitutes alternative data. You know, so, some people refer to reading cell site analyst reports or using sort of expert networks, but these things are in resources for quite a long time versus uh, as well as how you apply this data. You know, is it actually generating your ideas? Is it a sort of a last minute sanity check when it comes to sizing and timing positions? Um, and, you know, for us, we really dove deep into this process. We built our strategy specifically around trying to generate asset, um, alpha from alternative data. So f for us, it's a little bit bigger. But I think, you know, just to give you a sense, uh, AMA really did a great job. They surveyed about 100 different investment managers um, and released a report a couple weeks ago. And I think what they found was, on average, the total spend was, you know, 0.1% of the assets under management for these funds. But really, this is bifurcated in a big way. I think for the market leaders, which they define as the folks that have been doing this for over five years, the spend is closer to 5 to 20% of you know, non-salary expenses, um, which includes things like IT and infrastructure. But you know, of these 13% of the sample that are market leaders, about only 30% of them are using nine or more data sets. You know, we probably use closer to 40 plus data sets within our within our program here, um, but we really make sure to optimize our systems, which are all custom built, to maximize our return on investment and our return on time for this. Um, so there's a huge range of costs across the board, and I think managing those costs to not over you know not overburden investors is, is extremely important. You know, this next question is really for anyone here, and it may not be meaningful in this context because there are so many varied alternative investment data sets, and, and buyers of those uh, alt data sets can try to, uh, to negotiate exclusive arrangements. But you have an average cost that's, that a, 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 a shop might pay for an alternative investment data set. That, that's, I'm throwing that out to any of, any of our three panelists. There, there are definitely some some data sets that require a premium above the rest, but generally what we what we sort of come across when we speak to to clients, uh, I would say most data sets would would trade around you know fifty sixty thousand uh, dollars uh, per, per per year, but it's also very easy to to reach uh, much larger numbers. I mean uh, we are definitely falling into the to the more premium bracket. Um, and uh, it also uh, depends on how you you, you sort of do it, uh, how you uh, value it. Uh, do you take the contract of the entire firm? Uh, then you can go into very big numbers. Uh, most data sets are priced per, per, per desk. Per desk, okay. That's very, very helpful. Kathy, a related question is, okay, when you're looking at alternative investment data sets, what kind of data preparation is required to incorporate alternative data into real live or real time actionable signals that could be used by either discretionary managers or quantitative strategists? Give us some thoughts, please, Kathy, in terms of data prep required. 
Um, sure. Well, as with traditional data, um, the data needs to be cleaned and uh, the quality assessed. So things like outliers uh, have to be examined to see if they need to be removed and missing data needs to be uh, filled in. Uh, you may want to reduce the data for easier ha handling or um, make them uh, discrete if uh, you want to make categories out of something that's continuous, uh, clean text, like removing embedded characters that could cause data misalignment. Um, so that's all the stuff that you have to do with traditional data as well. But for alternative data, there's extra steps um, that might be required, uh, particularly, I guess we'll talk about legal risks, as things like personally identifiable information, you have to make sure that's not there, or material non-public information, or even biases. Um, in our curriculum, for example, in the ethics area, there's an example of uh, bias data um, where the city of Boston was trying to do a good thing with uh, eliminating bumps in the road, so they developed an app for people to report bumps that they encounter. And it turned out that this ended up being really biased data because of the digital divide where um, people with less money didn't necessarily have access to this mobile phone at that time and these apps. And so the, um, you know, the people with more money were being favored in terms of getting um, more attention. So bias is, is uh, something to examine with alternative data. And then there's also two other um, issues. Uh, a lot of it is unlabeled data, and I guess Peter would know a lot about this, where um, an example would be with the natural language processing, uh, having to tag words as perhaps uh, using a, a sentiment lexicon as positive or negative. Um, so there's oftentimes uh, data has to be labeled when it's big, and also big data is often unstructured. That's uh, data that's not organized into tables or relational databases. And um, there's new databases that can handle unstructured data. But, um, rather than SQL, there's a NoSQL. Um, and these are often used in conjunction with cloud platforms. Um, but that's getting a little bit more into the realm of data engineering outside of uh, the FDP sphere. Um, more germane to the FDP curriculum, uh, treatment of data preparation would be something like avoiding data leaks. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to um, forecast into the future, you want to make sure that your data set isn't containing something in there that is not a, that wouldn't av be available in the future, and you're actually including it in your, your data. Before we drill down into to a couple of other areas, that is the different kinds of alternative investment data that fundamental discretionary managers might use versus quants, and we are going to have a couple of questions on that in a moment. And I think all of us now have an interest, and I think there's a perceived need for higher frequency data. I'd like to ask Gene this question. Gene, if you had a list the two top advantages of using alternative investment data, and that you've already done that in, at your firm, what would they be, please? Sure. Uh, look, I, I think the first and foremost, uh, and, you know, one that's actionable today is for us, we really use it to drive our idea generation, which is, you know, I, I think slightly different. I think many managers who claim to use it out there really maintain the same legacy process, but rather refer to that data set to help them sort of guide their uh, timing and sizing. Um, as just, you know, one input or tool. For, for us, we really, you know, we're the opposite. We, we purpose-built our systems. We spent years building this out um, for the specific purpose. And what really, what really, what we think it does by focusing on alternative data versus the traditional resources like market data that quants use and fundamental data that a lot of legacy discretionary processes are built on, is we think it helps remove really the human bias, the, the group think, the past experiences that guide idea generation for most managers. And what we think it one it really helps us identify some contrarian ideas, but also avoid things like crowding. And I think that has really played out through a lack of correlation um, to both markets and, and equity peers. Um, I think the second main advantage to really taking this seriously today is really that we're still very early on in this trend. 
I, I think we're firm believers that alternative data will fundamentally change how managers invest in the year to come in the years to come. Um, but this process comes with considerable investment of time and a very meaningful learning curve. I think our edge is that we've been doing this for eight years already and we continue to innovate as new forms of data become available. Um, but you know, as Rick mentioned, um, both data and the ability to store and process all this data is growing at an exponential rate. I mean, just to give everyone a sort of an idea, you know, imagine a car going five miles per hour, right? And the speed of that car doubles every minute. So we're talking about 10 miles per hour after two minutes, 40 miles per hour after three minutes. After 27 minutes, that car is going 671,000 miles per hour, <laughs> right? A fraction faster than the speed of light. And I think that's what we're seeing within this space. And we're still really in the early innings of that. So we think the industry will look very different in five, 10, and 20 years. So really finding, uh, really investing in this today is warranted. In that, asking you the question of the two top advantages, Peter, I'm going to do the, the uh, opposite side of the coin and ask you, what are the biggest pain points when using alternative data? And by that, I mean difficulty connecting and combining ad hoc or silo data sources and projects using varied platforms, tools, and, and programming language. So what are some of the disadvantages or pain points associated with using alternative data? There's no doubt that a lot of the alternative data sets are quite big, so it requires uh, good uh, infrastructure uh, to be able to handle it and, and tools to do it, right? Cloud has helped a lot there already, but for sure it needs investment in, in infrastructure if you're not set up uh, for that uh, as a business. Of course, you can also get small data sets or uh, small data that are alternative, but generally, I mean, you'll start to get more value out of the larger data sets as they can often be applied uh, are more rich and can be applied in, in, in many other ways. But I would say one of the, the big issues is really, I mean, the very starting point mapping, just being able to map the data to tradable securities. Not all vendors, if you are going with a vendor, will be doing that. If you go uh, straight to uh, raw data, of course, you have to come up with it yourself. So you need to find ways of identifying companies or people or places, the entities that you wish to track and, and map that back to tradable security. That's not an easy task, especially because as a quant, for instance, you worry about point in time sensitivity. So you need to be able to detect the entity as they were at that particular point in time. So you would need to be able to pick up on Gillette up until the point where they got acquired by Procter and Gamble, and then there, uh, you need to track them as a subsidiary. Uh, so, so there's a lot of these sort of things. The same goes for something like Bank of America. I mean, you have Bank of America, you might also have common abbreviations like BAM or, 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 or um, uh, more recently BAML with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. So you have to pick up on all of these things and it's, it's, it's a non-trivial uh, task. Of course, there also generally can be quality issues because when you look at large data sets, um, there are more likely to be noise in there, right? Uh, it's in one shape or form. And so uh, having a high quality data set to work with, uh, whether you can get that from a vendor or whether you have to, to clean it, of course, uh, further, comes down to the sophistication of the vendor. So that is surely also uh, a, a, a challenge. But one of the things that um, I would also uh, argue and, and, and one of the things that you um, you have to, to care, uh, think about is also just the collection of uh, the raw content. I mean, if you go for something like uh, web uh, data, uh, if you, I would surely highly recommend you to go with the vendor that has sort of streamlined the process of going out and harvesting or, or, or scraping websites because you don't want to maintain crawlers. You don't want to uh, go back and say, ah, suddenly now, uh, I can't uh, 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 crawl this website anymore, or the content is gone. Have they moved the content behind a, a paid wall? And there's just so much uh, work involved there. So um, a lot of a lot of pain points. Uh, and uh, my recommendation, also being a vendor, so I might be slightly biased, is for a lot of these things, figure out where is it that you have your personal advantage. Is that in the nitty gritty parts of of actually getting the data, or is it turning the data into actionable uh, insights? 
or, or training people. Sounds great. Hey, Kathy, this leads to something that I know you've telegraphed before, at least as I know it's, it's covered by the FTP Institute curriculum. That's the, the chasm in alternative investment data. As Gene has said, you know, that we are in the early innings of the adoption of alternative investment data. And um, Peter just shared some of the, the pain points. But tell us some of the reasons that the, this chasm has been so difficult to cr cross for many fund managers, be they cultural, budgetary, whatever, whatever kinds of obstacles that would impede managers from um, cr crossing that chasm and using alt data. Uh, sure. I'm going to actually borrow from uh, some of your writings. Uh, you mentioned three three barriers, the value barrier, the risk barrier, and an information barrier. These are barriers um, to uh, the adoption of innovative products. So consumers need to feel that uh, the value that they're getting is worth sometimes uh, higher fees, for example, and they need to have a perceived uh, risk, uh, the risk of buying or trying a new product has to be worthwhile, and that's hard to uh, communicate uh, oftentimes in the investment world, so especially hedge funds that are limited in terms of um, how they can sell products and services. And then the information barrier is um, often about the myth of quantitative investments being a black box. And especially that that can um, be applied to machine learning, which needs to be um, and algorithms need to be understandable at least to, and um, sense that you want to know if decisions are being made correctly and, and uh, more widely that there's no biases. So in this area, um, quantitative investing or using machine learning. There would be less biases, um, fewer biases than with uh, using discretionary managers. Um, not to say that there's, you know, all algorithms are going to be unbiased, but uh, on the whole, they're doing better than uh, human cognitive bias. Well, thank you, Kathy. And Kathy referenced some of my writing. For those of you who have an interest, there was a paper that I published in, in December called Quad Quandary, Crossing the Chasm. Uh, if you do a search on the Journal of Investment Consulting, you'll see uh, that particular article, and, and you might want to read it. Let's transition now a little bit to the difference between how fundamental managers, that is discretionary equity managers, use alt data differently than equity quant. So, Gene, you working at a, a, a fundamental investment management um, shop. Please tell us some of the uh, the differences that discretionary managers use when considering all investment data sets. Sure. Um, so, so for us, I, I mean, the way we look at it is really data tells stories, right? And, and what we're looking to do is look at whatever can help us understand both consensus positioning as well as real-time trends um, that maybe the market isn't picking up. Um, for us, much of that value is in commercial activity. You know, we're talking about things like consumer spending and online behavior, for example. Um, but we also look at, you know, 40 different types of data. Um, and in times where, you know, for instance, right now we're going through COVID where fundamentals are taking a little bit of a back seat, we, we take a look at, you know, what might give us a granular perspective on COVID duration and, and recovery. There's a lot of interesting data out there. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's also a lot of differences between how maybe fundamental and quant managers uh, are, are using this. Uh, there's, you know, I, I think a lot of fundamental managers are really scratching the surface. I, I think also investors have this perception that quants are, you know, the going to be dominating the space. Um, but really, you know, what we're finding is larger quants are really not doing this as aggressively as – as, all, as many sort of believe, um, you know, alternative data is very difficult to work with. It's not uniform. It's, it doesn't have the, the sort of the history, the background. It's not as applicable across the sort of thousands of names they invest. Um, so we really think that it's actually going to be uh, sort of limited to a handful of market participants. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think what's underappreciated is, you know, is everybody going to be able to work with this data and decipher all the nuances? Mm -hmm. 
I also think everybody's going to use this data differently. You know, for our purposes, how creative can we get with, with, with the data? You know, energy funds might use satellite imaging to try to get a sense of the displacement within oil tankers. Um, PE funds might want to use more granular raw data. Um, it, it's, it's really all across the board. Peter, I, one of the first times RavenPAC came to my attention was I read a July 2018 paper published by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve Bank. The name of the paper, for those who may have an interest to, to, to read this, is it's called First to Read the News, News Analytics and Algorithmic Trading. Tell us a little bit how RavenPAC uses natural language processing to rate both the relevance of scores or the relevance of stories and determine composite sentiment. I know in this particular product that you developed at RavenPAC that you transmit this information to subscribers within 300 milliseconds. That's about the time it takes us to blink our eyes. So when you look at the use of that kind of, is it really exclusively to quants only and maybe a subset of quants that is high frequency traders? That is, if you are able to decipher relevance of a story and sentiment in milliseconds time, as a practical matter, how can someone use that for investment purposes for longer than a few minutes or a few days? Yeah, I mean, um, I could definitely both cover some some use cases as well as uh, how our process uh, works. But it's correct. I mean, we are a low latency feed. Uh, as you mentioned, we add about 300 milliseconds of latency. Um, and there's no doubt that early days when we started out back in 2007, 8 with uh, launching the first product, this was mostly picked up by uh, the most sophisticated quantitative hedge funds or, or what you would consider early adopters. Uh, the well-known names, uh, you know, that uh, are the famous uh, quant shops, they were jumping into this early. Um, and uh, but however, over time, uh, we also started to cater more and more for you know quantitative asset managers. And more recently, it's also been uh, fundamental uh, shops and so on, uh, cross-asset class. Um, there is sort of this notion that, or idea that uh, news uh, that we primarily focus on is incorporated quickly into, into prices, uh, that markets are relatively efficient. That's not the case. I mean, of course, if you look across large cap US names, uh, they, that market or that the part of the market is surely more uh, efficient than if you go to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Hong Kong or Chinese small cap, right? So, so there's definitely all of these sort of very natural dynamics in the marketplace that will, that will decide on uh, how quickly information gets in, embedded in price. But we are not talking about uh, milliseconds or, or even seconds. I mean, early days, uh, we had uh, quite a few conversations with clients that said, okay, you know, uh, what's your latency? 300 milliseconds. Okay, that's all, that wasn't almost uh, fast enough for them until they started, uh, until they started uh, testing the data and actually understood that this is not measured in milliseconds. Intraday, we're talking about uh, minutes and hours. And, and I would say most of our clients would even take a, a daily feed trading on our data over days, uh, weeks, and even months. Um, it all depends on how you use the data, right? You can definitely find some off-the-shelf uh, signals from the data, just event trading. Of course, they will decay faster, but often people are combining data sets together in a sort of mosaic or supporting a particular uh, use case. It could be, I want to understand, I have a pairs trading strategy, right? Uh, that works perhaps over weeks, let's say that that's the, the core signal, and then they want to understand when a, 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 a two companies deviate in price, should I, ex I bet on convergence, but well, if there was abnormal news on one of the names and uh, one of them had a lot of negative sentiment associated, perhaps we can't, we shouldn't bet on convergence, perhaps there's just a regime shift in the relationship. So by adding the uh, news content or sentiment data in as a filter, um, they are still trading a strategy that trades over longer horizons, but they suddenly are able to reduce their non-convergence risk. That would be one example. Or trying to overlay value factors, saying a company may seem cheap from a value perspective, but it's cheap for a reason. And the reason is there's been a lot of bad press that hasn't been reflected in the balance sheet yet. 
So perhaps we don't want to trade those names. So, so these have longer term applications. When it comes to how we go about measuring uh, or extracting information, we have a sort of a, a, a we, we produce something like 45 different analytics uh, for each company, let's say, that we detect within a news article. So for each news article that hits the Raven Pack engine, we look for all of more of a quarter of a million entities that we track. And for each mention in a news article, we will generate a record. And a record could be like a, uh, considered a role in an Excel sheet. And then it comes with multiple columns. So we will tell you the relevance of, of, of that company within the article. So relevance for us is somewhat of a heuristic. So we will tell you whether the company was detected in the headline, even the story body, the frequency of, of uh, the mentions, how many other companies were mentioned in the same article, and so on. All of that would be embedded within the relevance score that we would apply. We would then start to look for context. What were the events that it was detected in? Were they laying off people? Were this the target company in an analyst rating or in an acquisition and so on? So we start to look for the context of the mention. We'll also tell you the relevancy of that event detected. Was the event detected in the headline versus in the story body? And there's no doubt, especially if you look at large cap, they are very headline driven. So you could start to build or aggregate sentiment uh, based on these different hypotheses and figure out what's actually driving prices across different market segments. And then, of course, we have novelty scoring and sentiment scoring and so on. And, and we give you multiple techniques. We use very traditional techniques like bag of words. We also have developed our own proprietary techniques that sort of uh, uses human surveying in combination with sentiment extraction and magnitude extractions. Um, and uh, we also use base classifiers or base, uh, base approaches, uh, base classifier approaches and so on, because we don't believe in, in one size fits all when it comes to sentiment. We believe in multiple sentiment dimensions that each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Some that's are good at picking up, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that's very, very uh, helpful because I think some may be listening in today and thinking that only a certain select class or a subclass of quants, high frequency traders, might be able to use that. I'd like to, on the topic of high frequency, Kathy, following the corona crash and the ongoing global coronavirus recession, we've learned that many traditional economic indicators and survey data candidly have failed us because most economic data are survey-based and issued with significant lag times, it's basically useless. In fact, the uh, facts at the organization reports that one-third of S&P companies have withdrawn earnings guides for 2020. Here's the question in this, Kathy. What type of high-frequency or real-time data should asset managers and analysts turn to? I know you telegraphed that in when you talked about alternative data types in your first answer, but would you share with us some of your thoughts on higher-frequency uh, data that fundamental or, or quantitative managers might incorporate in their models? Uh, sure, yeah, I did mention, and, and I think um, Dean probably mentioned as well, credit, the use of credit card data, um, you know, the geolocation data, the um, satellite data and so forth can be far more timely than a lot of the traditional data. But um, I'm gonna interject a, a different perspective Sure. And that alternative data doesn't always offer its value um, in terms of being uh, more real time or higher frequency. In fact, as those types of data sets become more mainstream, uh, they might sort of lose their value in terms of trying to make uh, uh, earn alpha off of you know informational advantages that one of the uh, papers in our curriculum uh, called Rethinking Alternative Data in Institutional Investment argues that investors can actually be patient and that alternative data may have uh, value for longer term strategies, especially in the ESG area, for example. So I just wanted to offer that alternative uh, viewpoint. I think that's very helpful. Hey, Gene, you mentioned a report done by uh, Amer the called casting the net and in that you were quoted as saying that Lombard ODA has evaluated uh, nearly 700 different data sets 
before selecting only a handful. I think you indicated that you may have several dozen that you're using. I guess a couple of quick questions. How do you evaluate so many data sets, number one? How did uh, Lombard ODA calculate or quantify how additive or not an alternative data set might be? And why were only, uh, and again, you indicated a handful, but it sounds as though you're using several dozen. So those three related questions. Uh, I want to add, too, for the audience that Gene was a contributor to this paper called Casting the Net, How Hedge Funds Are Using Alternative Data. It's a terrific read. Go ahead, Gene. Sure. Uh, I'll try to be quick there. Yeah, so I think in terms of how do we evaluate so many, um, and look, all the credit there goes to Kesser, uh, who's just been doing this for a long time. Look, that's really just a function of longevity, longevity and expertise. Um, Kessler spends a meaningful amount of his time to continue to evaluate, to learn, to optimize the process. I think the only way you get through 700 different data sets is really uh, a process that's eight years in the making. Um, there's just no shortcuts from a timing and an experience perspective um, to doing this right. Um, in terms of how do we calculate or uh, quantify um, what alpha we're producing, you know, for us, you know, this is all we do, right? Uh, I think we spend a considerable amount of time and resources building a proprietary system, uh, and this system has the sole purpose of evaluating backtesting new data uh, very quickly and efficiently. Uh, I think people sort of don't, un don't really appreciate the amount of time and effort that goes into uh, to testing out potentially new data sets and, and mapping them so that they go seamlessly into your process. I mean, I, I think this is typically a one to two month process at a minimum for, for most of our peers. So I, I think having this system to maximize our return on time and incremental capital and, and know, you know, and exactly quantify how much alpha we're getting from each data set I think is big for us. Um, in terms of why we're only a handful selected, um, Look, I think for one, right, there's just so much data out there. Um, uh, by some records, you know, we're now talking 5,000 data sets. This is going to continue to grow. You know, it's really like drinking from a fire hose. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of the role for vendors is to sell the data that they have, um, but that data is not entirely um, necessary for everyone, and everyone has different approaches and different strategies and different uses for the data. Um, and, and to Peter's point, you know, how you use the data, how you massage the data can get you very different looks, you know, similar to credit card data. We get a lot of investors to tell us, oh, well, you know, isn't the edge there gone that's been around for so many years? Doesn't everybody have it? You know, well, you know, everybody has also had Bloomberg within fundamental investing for decades now. Um, but you still see a huge dispersion within returns for that. Um, but they're still talking to the same management. But really what it is is, you know, you're extracting different tones from the 10Ks, 10Qs. You're talking to the management teams and getting different insights. And alternative data is, is no different, right? Your expertise and your value there determines your insights. I think part of the misconception here is that, you know, this is an arms race. Right, that we hear that all the time. How do you possibly compete with these biggest funds that have seemingly infinite budgets in relation? And I think yes and no, right? There's material costs associated in building out the right systems, the right culture, and the right mix of data sets to succeed. But the data itself is only one of those inputs, and it also costs a lot less than many people think based on how you slice and dice it. I think ultimately it's garbage in, garbage out, and systems today can only process so much. Even if, you know, you did have the even if the systems could eventually handle the full load, you can't just buy and input every single data set out there because you'll have tons of overfitting, tons of false signals. So you need to very creatively and selectively curate um, and constantly reevaluate the best data sets in your roster to, to maximize your alpha. Um, different data serves different needs for various investment approaches, and where really where we think our edges is, is also within selection. It's picking the right mix of vendors that shine light on the topics that you want them to, but in a cost-efficient manner. Um, and I, I think that selection process is is no different than picking stocks, right? We just spend a lot more time doing it. Our PM is a lot more experience on both the investment and the data science side, which really pays dividend down the road when we use that information to pick stocks. 
That, that's that's very, very helpful. Hey, looking at our time on our, our chat box, we have not had any questions come up, but I do have uh, questions for all the three panelists, sort of uh, summary uh, questions. And I'm going to turn to you first, Peter. Peter, I know that Raven Pack hosts and posts daily updates to a coronavirus news monitor. I mentioned the coronavirus moments ago. Some folks have called your your Corona News Monitor the John Hopkins dashboard on steroids. Please tell our listeners a little about your your panic, your media hype, your fake news indexes that are part of Raven Pack's Coronavirus News Monitor, and let them know to what extent they might be able to access information on that dashboard. Please. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, some some weeks ago, um, we we launched uh, our uh, the Raven Pack uh, Coronavirus uh, News Dashboard. We wanted to 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 make uh, our data available to people in, in in this particular situation, and also to showcase, of course, the power of of our analytics and and how quickly you can actually uh, go about building. I mean, we built this uh, dashboard internally uh, over two weeks uh, and, and launched it for free. Um, as a, as a showcase to what you could actually do, as I mentioned. When it comes to the, the indices that we were tracking, I mean, we were trying to look for any, any references to coronavirus, to COVID-19, and so on, all the various ways that, uh, that it could be represented in the news uh, to sort of filter the data and to, to identify uh, trending topics within, within that set and also showing how uh, the the, the references to coronavirus uh, could change uh, across countries over time. So you referenced specifically our panic index and our media index and our fake news index. Right. Uh, when we look for the, the panic index, what we're really uh, trying to look for with that is to show how often does uh, uh, the news related to a coronavirus also reference make reference to, to panic or hysteria. And that could give you an an early indication of um, whether uh, perhaps something to do with uh, behavior in the marketplace, but also in terms of spread. And of course, media hype kind of it shows you the same uh, level of information, even though they're trying to, to get to it from different angles. Mm -hmm. uh, media hype, for instance, just looks at, if you look across all news out there in the marketplace, how much of that news references the coronavirus? And the crazy thing was that it started spiking very uh, already in, 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 in January. And by April, 60% of all news articles out, uh, out there mentioned the coronavirus in one shape or form. And, and I would say probably about 95% of my email re referenced the coronavirus in one shape or yeah. form as well, too, that, that, given its spread. Uh, let me just ask one thing. Yeah, One related yeah. question uh, to that. Then, Ken, I know you can map this, your coronavirus news monitor, to sectors like hospitality yeah. or airlines. Can you map it to individual companies, Apple computers, you know, um, pharmaceutical companies and the like? Yeah, I mean, what you could basically do what, what we call co-mentions. So you could start to look at coronavirus and, and all of these and say, what are the companies that actually appear in those articles? As mm -hmm. you, you correctly pointed out, I mean, uh, or what you pointed out with the airline industry and, and, and perhaps with the, with the biotech firms and so on, what we saw was that if you started tracking very early on, uh, you know, what were the biotech companies that got co-mentioned uh, 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 most with the coronavirus? And uh, you also started focusing on when there were talks about um, clinical trials and so on, so articles that would also uh, have those events embedded in them you actually were able to pick up uh, the, 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 the biotech firms that really outperformed. Uh, and, and we created like a simple strategy uh, with, uh, without uh, look ahead. And, and you would have picked up uh, Moderna and all of these sort of uh, companies that, that were developing vaccines, right? And, and you would have done extremely well with a strategy like that. That's great. Hey, in our remaining five minutes, sir, I want to both ask Kathy a question and, and close with Eugene. Kathy, tell us in your elevator pitch, if you will, how the Financial Data Professional Institute could it be of assistance to asset management firms who are interested in incorporating all data into their investment management process? Sure. Uh, the FDP Institute's curriculum is designed to educate individuals about techniques and best practices that is uh, fundamental data science principles. 
So FDP charter holders can be expected to have a data analytics thinking mindset that allows them to effectively assess the viability of a data science project. The fundamental principles could apply to a wide range of business problems uh, within finance, such as detecting fraud, setting insurance rates, or generating alpha. Um, the components of a proposal review would include an understanding of the business problem, uh, data preparation considerations that we talked about, modeling choices, evaluation, <laughs> deployment. Um, I'm going to skip to the short answer. Uh, by combining a knowledge of data science principles and techniques with financial domain knowledge, FDP charter holders are in a strong position to help asset management firms interested in incorporating alternative data into their investment. That's, ter that's terrific. And Jean, you're uh, the, closing us out. I know you authored or co-authored with Kesim, your your colleague, uh, Kesar Hassim, and I apologize if I mispronounced his name, but big data is a big deal. In your paper, you talk about alternative data being highly diverse and yet predominantly noisy. Tell us, how do you find signal in the noise and, uh, and recommending, I'm giving a five-star recommendation, of course, to your big data is a big deal paper because it was terrific. Sure. Um, and look, there's, you know, there's two types of noise. One is in all the new types of forms of data being created by the minute. Um, the other is in the financial markets, which is really a constant battle between sentiment and macro, macro factors driving stocks and company fundamentals. Um, you know, for us, people tend to have a very simplistic view of alternative data as a, as a tool or a very straightforward input into the process where you can just maybe write a check and you're on the same playing field as everyone else. Uh, that really can't be further from the truth. I think the real edge comes from how you process the data, how you combine it, and how you choose to apply that data. The volumes and the complexity from all these new forms of data really challenge even the greatest minds in the space. And to succeed, you need to be good at every aspect of it. I think the recent AIMA paper that came out a few weeks ago does a great job of highlighting this via the surveys that they put out. I think the greatest challenges and the factors for success for the roughly 13% of the participants in the survey that they deemed market leaders was uh, things like difficulty to backtest, system compatibility, technological capacity, finding the right talent, and then finding the right you know the amount of time to succeed. But for all the other managers that are really dabbling in alternative data, um, they blame things like you know the quality of the data and the reliability and the relevance of the data. And I think that just speaks to the fact that many will try and many will fail over the coming years, um, but only a few market participants will succeed. And those that don't appreciate what it takes um, and the meaningful resources and expertise necessary will blame the data itself, which I think you know hurts the overall investor perception of the space. For, for us, what we chose to do is we chose to launch a strategy that's all in on big data. Uh, we have a dedicated team, a culture, a proprietary system that's purpose-built for alternative data investing. This is all we do, and it's a pure play with no sort of legacy baggage that we're trying to fit it, fit it into. We, we, where we're different is we take a man and a machine approach, where broadly speaking, we use AI to drive idea generation and work with the data while the PM evaluates those signals uh, relative to the current environment, times and applies those signals based on 20 years of his investment expertise. And just one final point there, I think it's often assumed that quants will dominate um, in this space or already have. Mm -hmm. um, that's also just not true either. I think machines and AI for now are very much statistical engines looking for trends. They process more volumes in, of data that a human can, but they just can't apply the logic that's necessary to extract the value from that data um, which, if it doesn't have a statistical trend or enough data. I think alternative data is very messy, and AI can't really evaluate the environment, adapt, and respond quite like a human can. So people just need a little bit of perspective on where we are, right? We're about 12 to 17 years from AI having the know-how necessary to replace a salesperson. We're about 30 years away from AI replacing a surgeon, but we're 35 years away from AI replacing basic math research, right? And that brings us to 2055. Right. So, so the good for, news for is that Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens is still a, a, a very, very important part of the overall investment management function, yes. Yeah, at least we think so. Yeah. But with that hey. said, you know, it's a huge opportunity. 
let me close out on behalf of the New York Alternative Investment Roundtable and myself personally. I want to first and foremost thank our three extraordinary panelists for sharing your insight today. For all those who listen in, thanks as well for taking time to join us. If you have additional questions or want any additional information, including research, white papers, and the like, please feel free to contact either uh, B.J. Bellock, Britt Tunick, uh, any of the three panelists, or myself. Thanks again for joining in, and is, I think we're going to have a closing statement, too, from uh, the uh, New York Air. Yes, Allie? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add was thank you again. A terrific comment, a very timely and interesting topic. Uh, our next event is entitled Sustainability Investing in the Pandemic Era, Capital Allocation Issues, and that will take place June 16th at 1 p.m., and you can sign up for that on the webinar on our website. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Stay safe, healthy, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you as well, Ali.